crowds all talking on their cell phones. Teenagers let their iPods boom. The train is squeaking, creaking, which is reeking of impending doom. Conversations all around me seem to grow and overcrowd me. My lips, they speak the dialogue, but the words get consumed. And I have so much to tell you, so many things I must explain. Too many questions. I've been trying time and time again. Can you hear me? What I'm trying to say? Interference, noise, pollution, static seem to get in the way. We get tangled, get our wires crossed. Time's been wasted in my haste, and I have chased it, but the signal's lost. I'm trying to get through to you, but can't figure out how. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. My name is Murray Foster. Uh, yes, uh, very excited tonight. It's going to be, I think, a great night. Uh, this is the first night of the uh, Songwriting Masterclass series by Toronto Songwriting School. So this is going to happen every two weeks uh, starting tonight. And we've got some amazing uh, performers, some people who uh, I'm, I'm slightly gobsmacked that we, we landed. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have them. Um, so yes, tonight, two weeks from tonight, four weeks tonight, six weeks from tonight, uh, uh, you'll get another Masterclass. Uh, tonight is pay what you can, so please be generous and uh, perhaps even more than generous. Maybe pay a bit more than what you can. Um, just a quick overview of Toronto Songwriting School. Uh, the school was founded about seven years ago, around the time that um, I was leaving Great Big C. Um, I had, uh, you know, I, after a lifetime of accruing songwriting, writing songs and learning lessons from people, I figured, uh, I'd, and I'd been teaching songwriting at Trevis, I figured I'd start a songwriting school and Toronto Songwriting School was born. And uh, now we do a bunch of things. We do classes, we do getaways, uh, we do lyric writing workshops and uh, we have a recording studio, which is still very active. So please check us out if you, if you don't know us and you wanna know more. Uh, but really tonight's focus is about uh, Colleen Dauncey, who's doing our first uh, songwriting masterclass series. Uh, Colleen is an amazing uh, songwriter, as you will find out tonight, um, and an amazing uh, person, to, uh, someone who conceptualizes really well about songs and can speak very, uh, very intelligently about songwriting. So it's going to be a great class. I will give you a short, uh, a short bit of her very extensive bio. Uh, Colleen Dauncey is a pop songwriter, a musical theater composer, music director, singer, and vocal coach. She's an excellent vocal coach if you're looking for a vocal coach. Together with lyricist Akiva Romer Siegel, she has penned the scores to the musicals Going Under, the Toronto fringe hit Bremen's, Bremen Rock City, and The Louder We Get. The Louder We Get premiered at the Siegel Center in Montreal, received the 2016 Stage West Pache Family Musical Award from the Playwrights Guild of Canada, and has been showcased at the 2017 NAMPT Festival of New, Music, uh, New Musicals in New York, uh, the other Palace, London, UK, and the Grand Theatre in London. Colin and Akiva's newest musical, Grow, has been workshopped and presented at the Canadian Musical Stage Project, Sheridan College in Oakville, the 2018 Next Stage Festival, and the 2020 Godspeed Festival of New Musicals in East Haddam, Connecticut. Um, having been part of some of these uh, uh, festivals, uh, including the Canadian Musical Theatre Project, uh, which she has done twice, uh, and NAMPT, which I've been rejected by twice. I know that uh, she, uh, she is the real deal and she's, uh, she's made quite a splash in the musical theater world for sure. Um, but anyway, that's enough from me. Let us get Colleen on screen. Hi, Hi. how are you? I'm good. How, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Good, good. Um, so this is Colleen Dauncey right here, everybody. Do a little virtual round of applause in your living room. And over her right shoulder is, do you want to do the introduction? Sure. I was just telling Murray that this is my new plant. 
<laughs> which was probably not what you meant. So over, over there is my sweet dog, Luann. Yes. Yes, she's being a very good girl. And I was she's... saying during, I was sound checking for this earlier and I was singing a song and she ran over and jumped up on my lap. So well, I'm hoping she doesn't do that while I'm playing piano, but if she does it while I'm just talking, then so she, be it. She's so still that I, I, I don't take this wrong way, but she looks stuffed right now. Yeah, looks like a stuffed sweet. animal. She's just as sweet as a stuffed animal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how are you doing? You're good? I'm good. It's, you know, you know, we're all so doing the best we can. Give me 30 seconds of your pandemic lifestyle. Oh, boy. Okay, so pandemic's been, like, kind of strange for me, as I'm sure it has for a lot of people, but I actually, when when everything went down, sort of, like, early to mid-March, I was in L.A., and I was there with my co-writer, Akiva, and we were doing, like, a month, five weeks of just living in L.A. between two different projects we had and uh, doing a lot of co-writing and a lot of going to uh, to events to meet other writers and... It was amazing. We had the best time. And then all of this happened. So I actually ended up meeting another songwriter in L.A. and um, went to stay with him in Indianapolis for a little while and wrote a whole bunch of songs there. So that was the first half of my pandemic was like writing tons and tons of songs, doing a bunch of co-writing. And then I came back to Toronto uh, at the beginning of May and I'm in a, you know, an apartment here by myself, so it was kind of the exact opposite of that. So I've had a little bit of both. Um, but I also have always enjoyed doing co-writes. I love co-writing in person. That's my favorite thing to do ever. But uh, it, I've done quite a bit of it over the internet, and now I know a lot of us are doing that, and, and so I, I wasn't too scared of it. And I've been embracing it. It's been working out all right. But it's, I miss being able to sing with people in person mm. that's my favorite thing is harmonies singing in person yeah yeah um and further to that i mean i know that um your musical the louder we get had a production in calgary i believe yep in january right exactly yeah it ran from january to the beginning of february yeah and then grow your other one um was about to open at the london grand in london ontario and was canceled i mean that was that was mid-may i mean so it w must have been almost about to go live when it got canceled, right? Yeah, we were one week away from beginning rehearsals, and uh, that that was around March fifteenth when everyone said, "Okay, we've got to shut it all down." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think at that point, some people were still optimistic for shows that were happening a bit later. So we were starting to feel like, "Ah, that really, that's really too bad." But then everything got canceled for the next year. So I mean, we're all we're all dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. It, It'll happen someday. It's just postponed. Yeah, it's it's it is a crazy time for creators for sure. You know, it's, it's such an odd time. Uh, anyway, I feel like it's time for me to vanish from <laughs> from my rectangle to go away, and for you for your rectangle to get bigger, a bigger full rectangle. Um, but pull me back in whenever you want, and we can chat. But uh, yeah, let uh, take it away. I guess. Okay, sounds good. I'll miss you when you're gone. <laughs> Uh, anyway, hey everyone. So Murray gave you a little bit of an intro on who I am and what I do. I guess I'll give you maybe a little bit more uh, background on me so you know where I'm coming from. But while I'm doing that, if you guys can type in the comments, because I want to see, um, I'm curious whether you are the type of writer who normally likes to co-write or whether you normally like to write everything yourself. So, and, and maybe... So answer co-write or by myself and make that like whether that's what you're aspiring to do or you like doing that. So if you if you normally write by yourself, but you really want to write with other people, then write co-writer um, just so I can see. Because I do both of those things, but I actually prefer co-writing. So I'll talk more about that if there are people here who are interested in co-writing. Um, so that'll be helpful. Anyways, a uh, little bit more about me. I grew up as a performer. I did musical theater, but I also sang a lot of uh, contemporary music. And so I've always kind of been in both worlds. And so about 11 years ago, I moved to Toronto and started writing uh, as sort of more than a hobby. And uh, But I also really enjoyed writing as a hobby, and I think that's wonderful. So uh, if that's what you do, keep on keeping on. Um, 
but I wanted to sort of make that my career, and I ended up keeping one foot in each camp, uh, sort of mostly because that's I, I couldn't live with either one without either one, you know. So I kind of sometimes I feel people pushing me more in one direction, or I feel the universe kind of pushing me. But I really love to have one foot in each. Um, genre because they're totally different worlds and musical theater is just very different from the pop world um, in the creation of it and in the performance of it and everything so I love having that variety um, but I think if you do one of those things and not the other that I still think that's going to be very um, oh, there's a fly in here oh that just made me think of that episode of Breaking Bad I really hope it's not going to be like that <laughs> Um, anyways, all I'm saying is I think that, that whether you do musical theater or pop or folk or country or whatever kind of music you're interested in writing, there will be some things that I'm going to talk about that will be applicable to your work. So let me just look at what everyone said here. By yourself, both, co-writing, both. Okay. I think we got a healthy mix of both things. So that's great. I'll talk about both and you can just take what you want from that. That's also just kind of my philosophy in life is like, listen to people talk about what they do, listen to people talk about the things that I'm interested in, read a lot of things, and then form my own opinion and figure out how I can take that little piece of something that somebody told me and apply it to my work. For example, um, um, there aren't a ton of books about writing musical theater. There are a couple really good ones, but uh, there aren't a ton, but there are quite a few resources on writing uh, for the screen. So screenwriting and for writing for TV, so I've read a lot, and so have my co-writers read a lot about writing for TV, and then we'll take from that what we can apply to musical theater, and then go, okay, yeah, this other thing's not so applicable, but I'll use this. So I really encourage you to, to do that. Um, let's see. I think that's, like, I don't know. If you have any questions as we go, then type them in. I'll look at them every little bit, because uh, I'm really more interested in answering your questions and talking about things that you guys want to know about than just talking about myself for a while. But why don't we start out, um, since we were talking about LA, I'll play you actually the first song that I wrote in, um, right the first song I wrote after the pandemic happened. Uh, and like I said, I was writing with this writer whose name is Fred Miller and they had just announced, um, a shelter in place order for LA. So I woke up and I read the news and it said shelter in place. And my mind, I'm always looking for song titles. I'm looking for them everywhere. So I heard that and said, okay, that sounds like a song title. And here's a little tip for you. Uh, I keep on my phone a little memo in my notes on my phone and it's just called song titles. And every time I hear something in real life or read something or see something that seems like it would be a good song title, I'll just pop it in there. And then whenever I'm writing something or I wanna write something and I'm kinda stuck, I can go look at that list and then there's tons of possible song titles. Ooh, I'm gonna turn off my air conditioning. There we go. Okay, so I heard that, I heard Shelter in Place and I said, you know, I wanna write a song that is kind of applicable to the pandemic and what's going on. Uh, and I want it to be called Shelter. So I brought that to Fred and we wrote this song. And I guess as I'm singing it, you can sort of be paying attention to um, how it, I, I use a metaphor throughout this song. You'll, you'll pick up on it and we can talk about it after. But I basically didn't wanna just come out and say, pandemic is hard, this is terrible, what are we gonna do? Uh, so I found a metaphor that I could write, that, or that we could write the song lyrics in and stay within that sort of circle. Uh, and all the words we used had to do with that one sort of, sometimes people call it, call it writing in the key of something. So actually, I'll just let you know, this song is written in the key of sheltering from a storm. So in, because sometimes you can, it can be too much, right? If, if, if we're all going through a pandemic and I want people to listen to my song and, and be healed by the song, I probably, you know, my tactic anyways, is I don't want to write, this is terrible, I'm miserable, uh, you know, maybe you guys are feeling like that too. I want to say, we're in a storm. 
you know, I, like, and storms end and there will be an end. And here is possibly a way to think about it that might be easier than just thinking about all the facts and figures of COVID-19. So anyways, this song's called Shelter. Um, I'm going to sing it with a track that Fred and I created. And then luckily my friend Sydney Galbraith, who's a great mix engineer, did a little mix of it for me. So we did all of this in the living room during pandemic. <laughs> um, and you'll hear Fred's voice on here because I cannot uh, help myself. I need harmonies. I love harmonies. I want them on everything. <laughs> so there's a lot of harmonies on this track, but I'm going to sing all the lead stuff live. So here we go. Set out for the coast, carrying a ghost you couldn't shake. You packed a heavy load, and further from your home, you sailed away. When everything is done, you'll be the only one left standing. Set out for the coast, carrying the ghost of yesterday.
Oh, good. I was really worried that all the technology that I spent so long setting up would just explode during that song. <laughs> ah, so we made it past that one. I think that's the hardest part. Done now. Um, okay, see a couple comments. Love the metaphors of the sea and the tides. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. I was really trying to find a metaphor that felt the way that the pandemic made me feel which was overwhelmed, you know, being dragged down. Um, and then what in that situation would pull me out of that? How, how could I get myself out of that? How could I lean on somebody else to get me out of that? Um, so the, the shelter from the storm metaphor worked really well for that, I, I think. Uh, all right. So I asked you my one question that I had. I had another question. Oh, yeah. Um, my second question is, are you more interested in musical theater or pop genre songwriting? So I use, in my world, I use the word pop to just mean anything. Okay, I froze, <laughs> but I'm back. Is my microphone all weird for you guys? Somebody tell me. Murray? Oh, okay, maybe it's not weird anymore. Okay, yeah, so pop your answer in the comments. Musical theater or pop music, folk, country, heavy metal, whatever you're interested in. So I can see that. Is the microphone still weird now? I'm, I'm back. Hey, um, the microphone's great. And that sounded great. <laughs> I um, feel like it just, the whole program held out just long enough for me to do that song. And now yeah. it's being a little weird. Yeah. I think it's good now. I wasn't expecting to come back on screen. And I'm glad I wasn't doing something like illicit. So that's good. Oh, good, yeah. Keep, <laughs> keep it PG. Yeah, keep it PG. Um, I do want to say, though, and I, I expect I'm going to vanish back into the backstage again soon, that you do look so happy when you sing harmony. I do have to say, like, like you were you were talking about that's your favorite thing to do. And even when you're doing it with this virtual, you know, recording, it's it, you, I can tell that you, you light up, which is really cool. So, and that's a gorgeous song. That's a beautiful song. Thanks, I think it, yeah. I think it was... If I can't sing with people in real life, then at least I can sing mm -hmm. that track and feel like I've got some mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> okay. that was great. Uh, all right. Bye, Murray. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm seeing in the comments, there's a lot of country, folk, country, pop, um, and a little bit of musical theater. But here's something I think, and why don't I preface all of this by saying this is a haul, just what I think. <laughs> That's why it's my masterclass. Like none of this is fact and none of this is what you have to do. This is all just knowledge that I've collected and things that I think help me and work for me. So if, if it serves you, then take it. If it doesn't, please like throw it away. Don't listen, <laughs> to, don't listen to it. That you don't have to. Um, anyway, so, one thing that I think is that country music, which it seems like quite a few of you are interested in, and even folk music, uh, is actually pretty closely related to musical theater in my mind. Um, at least, yeah, at least more modern musical theater, maybe not like golden age musical theater, but um, it, those genres are really about storytelling. Um, so I actually, when I write a country song, think of it a lot more closely to the way that I think about writing a musical theater song. So I think actually all of this information will be totally applicable for all of you. Um, so when I talk about uh, storytelling um, in, in musical theater or in country music, like once in a while you'll get it in a more poppy kind of song, but it's really not as, not as common. You know, 
the song has some sort of story arc. So in musical theater, we talk a lot about like what what does the character want? What does the character need? What is point A at the beginning of the song and how do they get to point B by the end of the song? Um, and same with country. I mean, there's lots of really wonderful country songs out there that tell an entire story from beginning to end. Oh man, that just made, I was trying to think of an example and I thought of one that is not a song that I like to listen to, but do you guys remember that, that Christmas shoes song? It's like, Mr. Can I buy these shoes <laughs> for my mama, please? <laughs> that song is such a story. You like, at the beginning, you just think he's going to go buy some shoes and then you find out at the end that his mom is dying. Anyways, it's like, that's a good story right there. Um, so <laughs> that was a tangent. Anyway, when, when we're looking at pop songs and especially like a lot of the modern pop that I listen to on the radio these days, um, that's a little bit less storytelling and it's more about mood it's more of a mood song you know so when you're if you're interested in writing that kind of stuff then that's when you can sort of think okay like you don't need to start in one place at the beginning of the song and get to a different place by the end you because think about it the songs are for you know a lot a lot of dance music is for the club you know or or it's a driving song or whatever but it or, or you know dancing and, and you want to be in that same mood for the entire song. So if I try to do the musical theater thing and move you from, from one thing to another, and you're trying to dance to this song in the club, like, <laughs> you're going to be like, oh, wait, I just wanted to have that, you know, 120 BPM going <laughs> the whole time. Uh, so when you're writing pop, you know, you can think about it. If this helps you, you can think about it as writing for a particular mood, like, uh, you know, uh, I just got dumped, let's go dance and have fun. That's a mood. You don't have to tell me the whole story about how you got dumped. You don't have to tell me what life was like before and what you're gonna do after. You just have to tell me right now, how do you feel? What is that one emotion, right? What is that one mood that you wanna get across? And then just find ways to say that same thing <laughs> over and over again. Because again, in pop, repetition is key. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Okay. That might bring me to, I'll probably sing a couple more little things for you. Um, I've got a, that, so that song was, that I did was more poppy, kind of rootsy, folksy. I don't know what genres are anymore. Everything's every genre. Um, but I'll play you something a little more musical theater-y. Um, although I write very contemporary pop musical theater. And I write all my musical theater songs with my co-writer Akiva Romer Siegel, and his lyrics are very, he does a good job of finding lyrics that, that feel contemporary, but also do tell that story. And so I'm able to take those lyrics, and we usually write, he'll write lyrics first, and then I will come in and, and read his lyrics and figure out what they make me feel and what kind of a song that should be. And we'll talk about, should it be a slow song? Should it be a fast song? Um, and I'll talk a, a little more maybe about our collaboration in a bit because I love our collaboration. And we've worked together for 11 years now and we've got a kind of, we've written, I think, eight musicals at this point and a lot of standalone songs. We've written over 100 songs together. So we kind of have our co-writer thing down to a bit of a art science. Um, but this particular song um, is kind of a contemporary musical theater song. And I'm just going to sing, it's called Wherever You Go, I Will Go. And it's from a show, the show actually that didn't happen this year called Grow. Um, but will happen one day. And we wrote this show with, uh, with a playwright named Matt Murray. So he wrote what we call in musical theater the book or the libretto of the musical. So basically anything that's not lyrics or music he wrote. And then Akiva wrote the lyrics and I wrote the music. But we, the three of us worked together very closely all the time. Um, and this song, I'm just going to sing, I think, the first, maybe the first verse chorus or maybe two verses, two choruses. But then it gets into the bridge. And it's actually a duet. So they start singing on top of each other. And then... Um, an entire choir comes in. So I won't be able to do any of that. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop before all that happens. But um, yeah, this song was interesting to me because I, 
I had, we had figured out the verses pretty well and had them for quite a while. And I don't know if you guys go through this, but you know, you'll come up with a piece of a song and then you cannot, for the life of you, figure out the next piece. Like I had these verses forever and couldn't figure out how to make the chorus make sense or work or do what it needed to do. Uh, so sometimes when that happens, I'll try to push through and just write something. And other times when that happens, I will just, if I push through and nothing happens, I'll just put it in my back pocket. I will go about my life. I'll do other things. And then randomly when I'm in the middle of something completely unrelated, an idea will just pop in my head and then I'll run to the piano and it'll all just come out. So that's possibly a little tip. Like I always advocate for trying to finish every single song. Um, but if you if you're stuck, take some time. There's most of the time there's nobody breathing down your neck saying you have to finish this song. Um, so take the time. Don't beat yourself up. It'll come. It'll come someday when you're walking or when you're doing something completely unrelated. Walking is really good for that. Akiva says he writes a lot of his lyrics while he's walking around. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so this song's called Wherever You Go, I Will Go. It is a duet, but I'm just going to sing it all as if I was one person. But it's about two sisters who, um, they're actually Amish twin sisters. The show's pretty ridiculous and awesome. But they decide to go to the big city, uh, which is Toronto, and they get tangled up in, in kind of a messy situation where they end up accidentally growing and selling the best strain of marijuana that anybody has ever tried. And it's a miracle. Um, and then some stuff goes down and they end up separated. So this song, they're actually singing to each other through their sort of psychic twin connection, but they're not in the same room. Anyway, this is wherever you go, I will go. And if you have any questions about the song or anything else, maybe after the song, I'll see if there's any questions. Okay, let's see. So that particular song, I could not figure out the choruses. Um, and nothing, like I couldn't figure out what chord it needed to go to. Nothing felt right. And that's when I realized, like it just sort of came to me um, when I wasn't expecting it, is that I should go to a different mode or, or sort of like key on the note previous to where the chorus starts, to lead me in, because I knew I wanted the verses to sound minor, you know? So like this song is in D minor and 
It's very sort of like sullen sounding, you know, because it's a bad situation that they're in. But in the chorus, they're recalling um, a saying that their that their mother used to say to them and that they that they say to each other this wherever you go, I will go. So I wanted the chorus to sound positive, to be, you know, happy, a happy memory for them. So I wanted the chorus to be in a major key. So I was trying to figure out how to get from one to the other and banging my head against the keyboard. And then I realized if I switch on the previous note, the last note of the verse, instead of trying to switch on the chorus, that could really help me. So try that sometime. If you can't figure out how to make the switch, try switching earlier. Try shifting things later. Who knows, right? So like at the end of these verses, I go, um, should have honored the pact that we made. If only I had, maybe you would have stayed. Right, that's, that's, that note's not in that key, but it's in the new key. <laughs> so, um, that's a little tip there for you to try. Okay, let me look at these comments for a second. Got a lot of, got a lot of pop rock, folk country people, that's awesome. I want to sing and play and write as confidently as this one day. Oh, Olive, hi. <laughs> I love that comment because I'm glad it comes across as confidence, but to be honest, like, I'm so much more a writer than a performer. I grew up performing, and there was always something about it that, I mean, I liked it. I really love singing with other people, but the actual performance of it, I can kind of take or leave that sometimes, which is why I really, you know, went hard in the direction of being a songwriter, because you don't have to perform all the time if you're a songwriter. It's helpful to be able to play. You do need to know how to play your own songs or sing them or record them or somehow create something that you can show other people. But there's so many ways to do that. And if you don't love performing, you don't have to do that. There are so many performers out there that need songs to sing, right? So we see performers and we hear them on the radio and we think, oh, if I'm going to write songs, I have to be able to do that. But you absolutely don't <laughs> because that's not there. You know, for every performer that you see, there's probably 10 songwriters behind some of those songs or a couple songwriters behind each song, right? So absolutely work on becoming confident and be, be, be confident enough to like I am right now be able to sing and and my, my own songs to you and talk about them but you, you don't necessarily have to beat yourself up if you're not a performer um okay so I think that's enough of that <laughs> um let's see if any if you guys have any questions about everything that just happened there, let me know. Otherwise I'll sort of like move on to the next thing I want to talk about. Which I wrote on my phone. I don't know what I would do without the notes app on my phone. Okay, so I talked a little bit about the differences um, between musical theater and pop. And I mean, for as many differences as there are, I think there are that many similarities as well. So writing one really helps me write the other. Um, but here's a, a, a couple of other differences that come to my mind. Um, in musical theater, there's a few different camps on this, but a lot of sort of the classic musical theater uh, camp basically says you have to use true rhyme for all of your lyrics. So... For example, in this song, um, so when, when we're writing musical theater, Akiva and I really try to stick with true rhyme. And there's a few reasons for that, right? So true rhyme, that just means two words that actually completely rhyme, right? Not a slant rhyme, not something that sort of sounds the same. They have to actually rhyme. Um, and one of the reasons that's used a lot in musical theater is because we're trying to tell a story. We're trying to get across a lot of information during a song. And sometimes it's hard to hear all the words in a song. And so if you have true rhymes, then if the audience misses a, a lyric as you're going through, but then the next line they hear the rhyme, their brain can go back and fill it in and say, oh, you said light, so that word must have been tonight. You know, like that you can kind of, it's, it, it's helpful for telling the story. Uh, whereas in pop music, that has been 
I think I think the thing is when pop music first, like when music first started to be recorded and people could share music widely, there was a lot more true rhyme. This is my hypothesis. Someone can pr disprove me if you want to, but I think there probably was more true rhyme because nobody had heard all those things a billion times, but now we have heard those rhymes so many times in pop songs that they're actually just like boring. <laughs> and um, so in pop these days, actually there are people who will, who will go so far as to say it's actually better to slant rhyme, to, to say something that almost rhymes or has at least the same vowel sound. Um, it's actually better to do that than to have a true rhyme. Um, so, Sometimes those two camps will duke it out. But I think, you know, you can take a little from column A, a little from column B. It's actually good to have a song where there's some true rhymes and some not so that you keep people guessing. You basically just don't want people to guess every single time what exactly you're going to rhyme it with. Like, I kind of keep a running list in my mind of whenever I hear something and I'm like, oh, I will never rhyme that with that because it's been done so many times. For example, it makes me giggle because I feel like somebody must have made so much money off the fact that wife and life rhyme. <laughs> like, Just think of how many songs where they talk about my wife and I'm going to be with you for the rest of my life. I just think it's so funny. And I also just think I never want to hear another song because I just, where they rhyme that because I know if you say wife. Probably the next thing you're going to say is life, and then I'm done. Like, I'm already not interested anymore. So that's just me. Um, but, yeah, so rhyming. I think it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, think about Katy Perry, um, firework, right? Baby, you're a firework. Come on, let your colors burst. Make them go ah, ah, ah as you shoot across the sky, I, I. So none of those are true rhymes. And yet it's one of the most popular songs of this century. No, decade. One of the most popular songs of this, this decade, probably. And by popular, I just mean everyone has heard that song. I don't think it's the best song ever. But, right, it worked out pretty well for her. Um, so if you're writing pop genres, I would say don't get caught up on having to have a true rhyme for everything. If somebody tells you that you should, that might be because they're used to musical theater where... You do that all the time. Even in musical theater, now people are starting to not rhyme all the time. And that's also because some musical theater genres are, some musical theater shows are not sort of what you would call like classic musical theater genre. Um, for example, Hamilton, if anyone's seen Hamilton, that is a rap show, right? And rap is a pop music style. So in that musical, he uses all sorts of slant rhymes and they're fun and they're interesting and you're not expecting them. So then they surprise you and you're so excited. So uh, I say, don't let anybody tell you that you have to do one specific kind of rhyming. Just make sure you understand the different types and use the one that's going to help you tell your story the best way or, or in musical theater or set the mood in the right way, you know, in pop genres. Um, okay. I got a question here. Let me see. Uh, Mike Chandler. Hi. Do you ever suggest changes to Akiva's lyrics or do you always keep them as written? Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to be so curious if Akiva watches this. Um, but <laughs> because when we first started writing, so, okay, this brings me to collaborating, right? And there's million and one ways to collaborate. And so I'm just going to tell you my experience with it. But I think collaborating, collaboration is so valuable. Even if you think you're the kind of person that just wants to write all your stuff by yourself, I, th I think trying collaborating is, is a great thing to try. You know, try it out a few times. And also know that the first time you collaborate with someone is almost always going to be kind of awkward, right? You might have experienced that before because you don't know each other that well, or maybe you do, but you've never written together. And you just, you have to, there's a push and pull and you don't want to say anything mean to make them feel bad but you also don't like that lyric that they wrote or you think that there could be something better so you have to find that way of working together so when Akiva and I first started working together we were really really good friends but we'd never written any music together and he knew a lot more about musical theater than I did still does he knows tons about musical theater <laughs> and um I was sort of more of a pop folk girl at that point and so I just kind of took whatever he said, he wrote, he writes really great lyrics and he's got such a good, um, mind for character and, uh, and plot and, and it's just fantastic. 
And so he would bring me these lyrics and I was like, okay, great. Let me find some music for this. And we'd sit there together and I'd play some things and go, okay, does this sound like maybe and he'd be like, nah, I think it's a little too fast. And I'd be like, okay, what about this? He's like, yeah, it's a little too sad. And I'd be like, okay, what about this? And we just try tons of things. Um, but I would just take his lyrics as he gave them to me and, and set them to music. Um, I wouldn't suggest changes, but as we started working together more and we got more comfortable with each other, um, I started having more opinions and I also started understanding more about musical theater. And as we wrote one musical and then two musicals and then three, and I saw them up on the stage and I saw what worked and what didn't, I had more opinions on, on lyrics. So now I would say what we, and I make sure to, to bring that up in a kind way. Usually, <laughs> usually, um, I don't want to scare him off and make him not want to write with me anymore. You know, I, I find that a good way to bring, that up when there's a lyric that you're not really jiving on is to ask questions about it. Like one time Akiva and I had written this song and we could, I could not figure out for the life of me how it should sound musically. So I kept trying different things. I tried this, I tried that and nothing worked and it, I didn't like it. Although I liked his lyrics. I was like, okay. Um, and I said, you know, can you just explain to me what you mean by this chorus? Like explain to me what this means. And he was like, yeah, I don't really know. I'm still figuring that out. And I was like, oh, that's why. Like, it was so funny because I was beating myself up thinking like, I'm the worst writer ever. I can't figure out how to make this sound good. And actually, he couldn't figure it out either. He was like, I know I'm close, but I don't quite know what I'm trying to say with this. And so then we had to look at it and go, okay, well, maybe you're trying to say this. Maybe you're trying to say that. And we worked together on it. But it was it's just pretty funny how like you can often feel like you're the only one who's struggling with something or, or like you're bad and the other person's great, but often they're thinking the exact same thing. So asking questions is help is a helpful way to get to what you want. You know, you could say, what did you mean by that lyric? Or, um, why is that character saying that? Or, you know, like, why are you using this kind of language? Or, or, you know, instead of saying, I don't like this line, this line doesn't make sense to me. Right. You could just say, explain that to me. Um, and, and so now when Akiva and I write songs, we, I would say probably, I don't know, somewhere from five to 10% of the lyrics that end up in our shows. Uh, I had something to do with. Sometimes I'll write like four words and stick them in and he'll be like, okay, great. Or sometimes I won't rewrite anything, but I'll give him a, a little nudge in, in a certain direction. And same with music. Like he'll come up with a little melody and I'll be like, oh, that's great. Let's put that in. So now we kind of, there's a little less division between music and lyrics. And it's funny because when I go back, just the other day we were re, um, I was re-notating because I do like, you know, I'm, this is my iPad here and I've got, I don't know if you can see this, but I've got sheet music that I made for that song that I was just singing. And I was redoing the sheet music because I wanted to put it on my website for people to buy and sing. And, uh, but it was one of the first songs we'd ever written. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, I called Akiva. I was like, I don't know how I ever let you get away with all these lyrics, um, like without bringing up anything about, oh wait, that doesn't quite make a lot of sense. Like, let's look at that. He's like, oh yeah, I know. I didn't realize that either. So, you know, that's the answer. To the, that's the really long answer to your question, Mike. Um, but I think... In my opinion, if you have a healthy collaboration with someone, you should be able to ask questions. Uh, you know, if, if you are divided like music and lyrics, you should be able to have some interplay because sometimes you'll just notice something that they didn't notice, you know? Or sometimes a keyboard will be like, hey, that sounds, that music you came up with sounds exactly like that other song we did. And I'll be like, oh yeah, you're right. I'm getting stuck in, in my like little mode. I should shift out of that. So, um, and if, I also have other collaborations on, in the pop country world where I'm writing music and lyrics and the other person is writing music and lyrics as well. So we're both writing both. And I love that too. And so in that case, like I think if somebody writes a lyric and brings it to you and then like y if you're both doing both, you should feel completely comfortable to play around with it and say, hey, like, what do you think about this? Make sure you ask them if it's okay. Like if, if they really just want to give you the lyric and then go away, that's fine too. Um, but yeah, I think I, here's another little tip. I think if you're going to tell somebody, like ask a question about a part of the song or say like, Ooh, this part's not quite working. It's always helpful if you can have an idea, right? So instead of saying this part, the chorus isn't working, you need to figure something out. 
like that's just going to make the other person not want to write with you um, or go home and, and think that they're terrible. But if you say, you know, I like this one part of the chorus, but I feel like it needs to be in a major key. Why don't we try that? Right. Like have an idea, have something you can offer. So you're not just taking away from the experience that you're building on it. OK, questions. How did you get into musical theater? That's a good question. Um, I actually started performing in musical theater when I was really little. I think I was five, maybe six. My parents put me in my first musical theater class. My parents are both, um, they were teachers before they retired, um, but they're also musicians on the side and they played music my entire childhood. So whenever we would express any interest in something musical, they would be like, okay, let's find something for that. So uh, I think I saw a musical and I was like, I want to do that. So I got to do musical theater and, and I was always performing in it. But like I said, it was never like, I do love performing, but I think more so than the actual performance day, I love like rehearsals and working with other people and having a group and really feeling like I was part of something and singing with everyone else. Like I could kind of take or leave the crowd <laughs> being there. Other people like light up when the crowd's there, which is wonderful. Those people should absolutely be performing. But, um, but I kind of, you know, at 19, I decided I was done trying to perform uh, in musical theater. And then I actually went to university and did an entire degree in international business. <laughs> which was completely unrelated and, uh, and, and helps me now with certain things for sure because now I'm a freelancer in music and I have to figure out how I'm going to run my business as a musician and as a music teacher and as a composer. Um, so it is helpful, but I kind of took a little detour and found my way back. And I actually really only started writing musical theater because I'm, I had been friends with Akiva that whole time. We actually met in high school musical theater class. Um, and he had started writing musical theater lyrics. And he was like, I need somebody to write the music for this. And I was like, well, I could try, you know? And that was 12 years ago. And then I, and I wasn't living in Toronto at the time. And that one song went over so well that I ended up moving here. And uh, just like the rest is history. So that's one, uh, that's one way to just, <laughs> get into something to say, hey, I'll try. I'll try that. I will try almost anything once, you know, like see if I like it. There's so many things out there. So many, so many different ways to be involved in, in music even, right? So you, if you, if you don't want to perform, there's a billion other parts of music that you can be involved in. Uh, okay. Hope that answers your question. Olive, what if you're both lyricists? That's a great question. Um, if you're both lyricists, and you don't, neither of you writes music, then find another person to bring into your collaboration because you're gonna want someone who writes music. If you're both lyricists and you're also both musicians, then that, again, that's, I do that all the time. I find it really fun. You can both you know, have your instrument and get in a room together or for the next several months, just get on Zoom together or whatever you wanna do. And uh, one of the things I think is, um, that brings me to a tip I wrote down on my phone because I thought about it the other day, which is if you're going into a co-write, especially if it's your first time co-writing with someone, but really like anytime you're co-writing with someone, have some ideas, right? So have some lyrical ideas, right? It, it, have a note full of different ideas, have your song titles, have little, I have a, a million voice notes in my voice notes app on my phone that are just, 20 seconds of a song and then and you know sometimes that just comes into my mind I sit down play it and I go oh like I have this one co-writer uh, Julia Appleton and I just love writing with her and sometimes I'll get ideas and I'll go oh that feels like a song I really want to write with Julia so I'll record the first 20 seconds and then I'll put it away and I won't think about it for a while unless like it all just comes to me but it usually doesn't because I love co-writing more than writing by myself um and then when I get together with Julia, I can go, oh, hey, like, what do you think about this? And I'll play it for her. And, uh, and she'll be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like, I might have some ideas for that. And I'll go, okay, now you play me something. And she'll play me 20 seconds of something else. Or she'll play me a verse of something that she can't figure out the chorus for. And we'll go back and forth. And then we'll go, okay, which one of those ideas really was pulling us today? Like, which one feels like we want to write it? And then we'll pick one. So always have some ideas. Never show up empty-handed. It would be like showing up to a dinner party and not 
bringing anything, right? Like you want to be the person who has ideas and who brings better to have more than less, really, is what I'm saying. Okay, yes, both and both. Yeah, okay, so if you're both lyricists and musicians, I mean, sometimes, so like in that situation I was just describing with Julia, often if I've come up with like, you know, the first bit of the song or what I think might be the hook of the song or, or something, then maybe I'll write a little bit more of the lyrics for that song and sh so it ends up being like a 60-40 situation. Like, or, but sometimes it's 50-50, sometimes it's 70-30. Like it, it, very rarely with her, with another lyricist, is it like zero, 100, <laughs> right? When, usually when, a, when I, as a lyricist and musician, am working with another lyricist musician, usually we share on both. And we'll just go back and forth. And that's what I think is really great about, you know, writing live or writing in a Zoom room it's like you can, you can play off each, uh, off each other's ideas right if someone says oh i've got this but i can't figure out the next lyric you know maybe you'll see something and say oh what do you think about this so i think that's there's absolutely no problem with you both being lyricists and musicians that's great um does that answer that olive and okay i think at this point I do have another song I could sing. What do you think? Oh, okay. I'll answer this one question and then I'll play another song. Can you make money with your songs with royalties, pop versus musical theater? Yeah, great question. Um, you know what, Murray, why don't you come join me for this one? Because I've got some ideas, but I know Murray also probably will. And uh, hi. Hi. I was ready for it this time. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. The first thing I was going to say is like that, that, that is a great question. And the answer is always changing. Like it's changing right now as we speak because the landscape is changing and what you could make money doing 10 years ago, you can't make money doing now because no one's paying for it and, and they're paying for different things now. So yes, you can make money with songwriting royalties for sure. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the musical theater side of it, and then Murray, you can talk about the pop side. I mean, I sure. know you both have experience with both, but you probably have more experience with the pop side of that. Um, in musical theater, yes, you can definitely make money on your royalties. There's sort of there's two um, different streams of revenue from your musical theater songs. And one of them is whenever your musical, if you're, if you're writing in context of a larger musical, then whenever that musical is performed by other people, you get um, licensing royalties for that. So if the theater down the street or across the country or wherever is going to do a production of a show that you've written, they will be paying you a licensing fee and so you're paid that way. And a lot of the time it's also based on um, how big the audience is that they're planning on performing to and how much they sell. But often there's like a guarantee of a certain amount of money and then you'll get additional money if the show sells out and, and does, a really, um, does really well. Also, so that's, a, and, and the rights to your show, like when you license them your rights, that's called the grand rights. Of, of a musical. So those are the rights to do the whole show in context with the script, with the costumes, with the set and the stage and everything. Um, those are the grand rights. So you can get money on that side. On the other side, if those songs are ever performed out of context of the show, those are called the small rights. So every song has its own small rights. So for example, from my musical, like this song I just sang, Wherever You Go, I Will Go. If somebody wanted to sing that on, put it on their record, um, or sing it um, at a concert, they could do that. They would have to, if they're going to put it on the record, they would have to pay me mechanical royalties. Um, if they were going to sing it at a concert, they should be probably purchasing my sheet music from my website so that they have the music to give to the band or whoever's going to play it um, so I can make money that way. And also they should be sort of, sort of complicated, but depend, depending on what the venue is, they might be paying SOCAN. Um, 
does everyone, I hope you guys know what SoCan is. If not, Murray will tell you all about what they are. <laughs> Thanks. Um, right. Um, and, but essentially they're a performing rights organization and, and they'll collect your royalties for you. And um, so the, if it, like at all the concerts or whatever, if they do this song, those companies pay SoCan and then SoCan will pay me because they know that I wrote the song, but I have to, it's complicated. Like they have to know that the person's going to sing it. So I can submit uh, a set list and say, oh, this person's going to sing my song and then I'll get like one cent or something. <laughs> so uh, the, I don't worry about that as much as the other revenue streams because th they're, I'm more in control of the other ones and I can make more money that way. What about you, Murray? Well, I mean, I... Uh... Uh, I'm, I'm always nervous answering this question because um, it's it's because it's tough to make money from music these days, you know, and it's harder than ever. And I would say with musical theater, which I write now as well, and I, I haven't gone as far down the path as you have, but um, but using you as an example, I mean, you wrote how many musicals before you made a penny from musical theater? You know, four, something like that. Well, that's a good question because actually. We made money on our very first musical, but that's because we produced it ourselves. Was that Fringe? Uh, no, the Fringe it was actually, show? the very first thing we ever wrote was this song cycle, which is like a musical, but just without any speaky bits in between the songs, just song after song after song, but they're musical theater songs. And um, we put on that show 10 years ago. It was called The Subway Songs. And uh, we, we just wanted to get our music out there. We really weren't concerned about making money, but we wanted to get our music out there and have people start noticing us as songwriters. So um, I wrote the show with Akiva. And so we booked a venue in Toronto, in Kensington. It was called the Bread and Circus. It doesn't exist anymore. But I think it had like 88 seats. And we booked it for two nights. And really our only goal was to make enough money to cover the cost of renting, you know, renting the space and, and paying the band um, on the singers. And... I mean, I honestly don't even know if we paid all the people. Always pay your people. But this was like 10 years ago, and it was our first thing. So some of them might have done it as a as a favor, which is very nice. Um, but if you can, always pay your people. But, uh, yeah, we put it on ourselves, And, you know, people paid to come and, and, and see some live theater. What I think is really cool about Toronto in particular is I feel that people are um, – more receptive to sort of trying something that might be new or like unknown. Sometimes people will say, Oh, my friend told me about this thing. It's really underground. You got to go see it. And then they'll come. Right. So it's sort of one of those build it and they will come situations. I certainly wouldn't say, you know, write your first show and, and you're going to make a bunch of money off of it, but like put it out there, charge a little bit for your tickets see what you get right mm -hmm. um and then our second show was a fringe show so if anyone out there is writing musical theater um or or plays you should absolutely or shows like fringe is very varied these days there's comedy shows there's all sorts of stuff so definitely apply for the fringe festival because sometimes you get in and then you get to they give you a venue and um you can make some money that way uh but yeah the first show where we really made kind of enough money to say that like that, that that we were being valued the way we should be valued was probably four shows in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there, there's a great lesson there, I think, in, in that, in what you just said, both for pop and for musical theater, which is that um, you really have to have a DIY, like do yourself attitude and be your own producer initially, at least. Right. Um, you have to do all the work and it's a lot of work on top of the writing and all that stuff. Um, just to put on your own shows, just to get noticed, you know, and so, and your path is actually really smart, a self-produced song show, then a fringe show, which is like a step up in terms of ambition um, and, 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 and kind of commitment to the, you know, to the show. And then, and that's when the eyeballs start, you know, swiveling around and seeing what you're doing. And then, you know, the, the powers that be, the incubators out there um, can, you'll, they'll start taking your calls basically. And then you climb the ladder that way. And that's kind of true with pop as well. Like you really have to, especially these days when, when record companies uh, are because of, because of the internet and because there's so much content being put out all the time, um, like record labels can just sit back and sort of cherry pick whatever pops, right? 
And what I've heard is like you need five million hits on YouTube before they before you get their attention, right? And so imagine the work you have to do to get to five million hits on YouTube. It means that you've not only perfected your craft in terms of of the writing part of it, but you've you've figured out the recording part and probably the the you know the promotion part of it as well, right? So I think I think the big lesson in terms of that question is that um, it's less about where you can make more money or can you make money. It's like it's like be ready for the long road and be ready to really dig in initially and do it all yourself and build it yourself um, and that'll take years and then you'll have some kind of infrastructure, not just a, a skill set that is marketable, but you'll have an infrastructure and you'll have you'll you'll you know start to get noticed by the powers that be, you know, and certainly with musical theater, and maybe that's this is true of, you know, there, there are only a handful of real incubators in Canada in terms of musical theater. Um, and there are only three major labels, right? And so these are the people whose attention you're trying to get, and you have to really work your ass off to get to that point where they're like, this, this kid's got something, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that covered all the ground that we were supposed to cover with that answer, but yeah, I mean, I would just also add that there are a million and one ways to make money doing anything. You just have to find that way that is not oversaturated and impossible to get to, right? So, for example, one thing I do is I teach voice lessons because I love singing and I'd rather be working with someone on music than finding another kind of job to support my my songwriting habit so but I think it's all related right and then once in a while one of my students will want to sing one of my songs and they'll buy my sheet music I mean it's just it's all connected right so you can find ways if you're really um creative you know you can find ways find where where the money is right instead of just trying to do one thing and hoping one day someone's going to give you money for it figure out what people are paying for right and I also heard a really interesting um tip once that uh, if you if you really want to make money doing something, you have to figure out how you can help people with that thing, right? Because people will pay you to help them. They will pay you, you know, to 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 make them feel better or to make them feel connected or to help them. You know, if you're really good at computers, they'll pay you to to help them with your computer with their computer. Like, it's about helping. It's about how can I fill a need that people have. Mm -hmm. because that is what people pay for. Yeah. The way I think about it is um, sort of the front lines of music and then the, the back from the front lines. And the front lines of music for me are you are the singer, you are the performer, you're the writer, you know, and you're, you want your face on the billboard. That's the front lines. And that, that place is really tough. Like it's very tough to monetize that position. But there are a bunch of positions just behind that that are easier to monetize. One of them, as you said, is teaching, mm -hmm. which I do as well. Another is having a home studio. Like another is learning that craft, you know? And you really have, as my friend Dave Matheson says, you have to be a mile wide. Like you have to do it all to, to make a living in music these days. Um, and so be on the front lines for sure, if that's your dream, but also be in that sort of supporting role where you're supporting other musicians and helping them and, and you know, trying to, and floating the boat that way as well, I think is really, is really important. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, and I mean, also, what's in, that's definitely the route that I've chosen in my life is to be wide and to try a lot of things in music and, and go with the opportunities that come to me and make a lot of friends and, and, and figure out, you know, see where it takes me uh, and, and make money from whatever I can. There's definitely another sort of camp which I think is also valid. It's just maybe riskier, which is to specify, like, you know, to really become a specialist in that one thing that you know you're really, really good at and spend all your time becoming a specialist, which I think is valid as well. The only thing is you still have to pay your bills and you still have to feed yourself. So that if you're really interested in just like kind of one very specific thing and you know you're really good at it and you want to become the best person at that, then I would suggest, like, get a job doing something that's not related to music. I know several people who, you know, they they are servers and they're really good at being servers. And then they have more time while they're doing that job to think about that one specific thing they're really good at doing or that one thing they just need to do. So, mm. I, you know, you can kind of choose either path. 
either way, you're going to have to work really hard. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, there's one question here that I will jump on. How do you find someone to co-write with? Um, my self-serving answer to that is to take a class at the Toronto Sarming School, uh, which is we're now online, so you can be anywhere in Canada and take a class. But what's your advice in terms of finding co-writers? Yeah, I mean, that's so awesome that you guys are online now and you can, people from anywhere can just join yeah. you. I love it. We have, yeah, we have people from Calgary and PI and it's awesome. So. I love it, I love it. Yeah, I'd say that's a great way to do it. And uh, also go to, okay, this is a post-COVID answer, <laughs> but I do believe we will get past this one day and we'll be back to normal life. But go, when it's done, go to places where the music that you enjoy happens. You know, go to shows go out and support a local singer songwriter because I guarantee there will be other singer songwriters in that room. You know, there'll be the ones mm. on stage and then there'll be some in the audience and they'll be their friends. Um, yeah. I've, I've made most of my songwriting friends in by just going to shows and, and showing up and being a good listener. And then at the end, you know, people are milling about and I'll meet people. And then that person will introduce me to that other person. And I mean, I've probably co-written with 30 people 30 to 40 people in my life um which includes like i do a lot of co-writing with just one person so like i'm sure there are people who have co-written with a lot more people but but you know i'd say maybe 10 percent of those ended up being really useful co-writes like you have to it's just like making friends right you're not going to be best friends with every single person you meet but you're going to find those ones that are kind of magical mm -hmm. connections where like the sum uh, the whole is is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So, um, yeah, try a lot. Like, if you go to your first co-write and it doesn't go over so well, just say, like, great, that, thanks, that was fun. Like, maybe yeah, get the hell out of here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just leave, leave my house now. Thank um, you, next. <laughs> can we, um, can we, can I interview you a little bit? Oh, okay. Um, and also, um, if people have questions, we're probably going to go for another 15, 20 minutes. So if people have questions, definitely write them now, those burning large or small questions that you have. First of all, I think you're great at masterclassing. Oh my goodness, thank you. Yeah, I think that, that was really great. And I've made some notes that I'm gonna steal from you and pretend they're my own <laughs> when I teach classes. Um, but here's my question for you. What are the top three pieces of wisdom that you have heard when you're sitting across from a co-writer? So in the room, you know, in the moment, in the heat of battle, the, the sort of lines of wisdom where you're like, wow, that is so wise, that's so smart, I'm going to take that to heart, I'm going to live by that now. Do you have a few of those, that like those moments where the clouds parted and... Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure I have a, a whole bunch. It's just, uh, I mean, for me, it's usually like getting a getting out of my own head thing. That's why I love co-writing, because if I'm sitting here by myself, I will get so in my own head that I can't finish anything. Um, so often when I'm sitting across from someone, they'll, they'll say something that I never would have thought of. And then that's like that aha moment for me. Um, yeah. That's a really Let, good question. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. And I'm going to uh, say something, which is that okay. you and I have sort of, um, uh, you and Akiva came over to my place for dinner with my friend, Mike Evan. And it was delicious by the way. You're a good. Thank guy. you. Thank you. Um, that's all I want to say now. Um, and we, toward the end of the evening, we all jumped on instruments and we, we wrote a song together, which I thought went really well. What, what was amazing about you, I think, and I've never seen this to the same extent uh, in anyone else uh, in terms of co-writer, you're absolutely fearless. Like you are, you were on the piano and you're like, here's an idea, what's, okay, play, what, sing me that thing again. Like you were like orchestrating, you're driving the bus for sure but also, in my opinion, just fearless in terms of, like, not only was there no ego, but you were so keen to chase down that thing, to chase down that, whatever it was that we could chase down, you were like, you, the, the, the sort of eagerness, the hunger you had to find that thing. I was, I was amazed at that. I thought that was incredible. And I think that's a lesson to everybody, which is, um, it's what I took away from it, which is like, you know, and, you know, I think a lot of people in courting sessions me included, are tentative and nervous, and there these there's ego at stake, uh, and all that stuff. You know, it's it's a weird dance. Um, and I thought, and and partly I guess it's from your experience and and your love of co-writing, but 
I've never seen anyone just jump into it and be like, let's do this. Let's throw ourselves into it. What do you have? What do I have? Let's make something happen in the next half an hour. And it was, it was great to see, like it was, it was really cool to watch. So that was me providing a bit of cover for you to answer the previous question. Oh, well, I just want to respond to that now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thank you. I, I, I think that, you know, part of that comes from my, I just love it so much. Like, I just love being in the room with other people. I also um, kind of more recently, especially when I was in L.A., I got introduced to this sort of um, concept of like sometimes in a lot of the time in a co-write or in the studio, there is like an alpha and then a beta or you know you know when you get into a room with an alpha right and I think sometimes I a lot of the time I, look I kind of consider myself wait let me explain what I mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> as she digs herself out of a hole here no no what I mean I'm proud of whatever I am but um you know so the alpha person is, is kind of taking over and running the show and and the beta person can be there to to like offer ideas but is not kind of steering the ship and i think and then sometimes there's two alphas and sometimes there's two betas and 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 it can all of those ways can work and i've seen them all work and i've been both in both situations i kind of consider myself like a shapeshifter i will be whatever the room needs me to be um because what i want the most is for the co-write to be successful um, so, and, and often I'm walking into a situation where we like, we actually have to write a song for a specific purpose and it needs to be done. Like I was in LA, um, writing with this great writer, uh, John Kleinbell and he's a producer and, and we had a brief that came in and we were going to write a song for a podcast, like a specific song about a specific topic that's going to be on a podcast. And we landed it by the way, which is exciting. Um, but you know, John was, it was in his studio and he knew what he was doing. And, and I was like, okay, great. I'm going to be here for this. Like I am here for this. I'm not going to try to tell John what to do in his own studio. And it worked out great, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and we needed to get that song done. And if we were both alphas fighting each other the whole time, like that's not going to go over as well, in my opinion. Uh, if you have all the time in the world, then by all means, like you can butt heads all day. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but then sometimes I'll show up and you know, like, for example, that day when I was at your place, probably what was going through my mind is like, man, yeah, I want to work on a song. Like, hey, guys, here's what what I've got. I'll show what do you have? Like, I'll be the facilitator if nobody else is jumping into that position because you need a leader sometimes. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so let's flip that around. What, uh, in your opinion, makes a co-write fail? Oh, like blocking ideas. That's absolutely what will make a co-write fail. You can't block ideas. If you if you block that other person's ideas all the time, you might as well just be writing at home by yourself. Um, we have this sort of saying um, in musical theater, I'd, I'd probably you have it as well, which is that the best idea in the room wins, right? So it's not about ego and it's not about, oh man, like, especially when you're writing a musical because there are so many different components, right? There's a lyricist, a book writer, there's a composer, there's an arranger, there's an orchestrator, there's a choreographer, director, producer. There's so many people that if everybody brought their egos to the table, we would just like all fight all day and there'd be no product at the end of the day. So, um, so yeah, we, you know, we throw our ideas on the table. We say, here's a solution that I thought of. And, and we try them. I think trying all the ideas is so important. This could be an answer to your previous question, right? Like, I think when I first started writing, um, there was definitely times with Akiva where, you know, he'd say, oh, what about this? And I'd immediately say, like, no, that won't work, you know? And eventually, he probably had to stop me and say, like, hey, let's just try it, right? Like, let's just try it. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, we have endless time right now. Like, let's... I'll, I'll play for you this way and then I'll play for you the other way and whichever one we like better will win. Like you won't know which idea is good until you hear it out loud. So if, if, if you're writing with someone and they think it, it would be great to put a G chord there and you think it's gotta be an E minor, then like try them both. You'll hear them out loud and then you can go from there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of, a, a lot of, it takes a lot of experience I think to be in that situation and to not, be overprotective of your babies, which are your ideas, you know, and, and to, you've got to sort of put them out there, you know, in, in, in a way like sort of forthrightly, but then not worry if they live or die in the room, you know, and that's, I think that takes a lot of experience. I think you really have to check your own ego um, and all that stuff. And really just, as you sort of say, be a cog in this machine 
and offer up whatever you can to make that that final product work. And it, it, it takes a while, I think, to, it takes a while of experiencing it, but also self-monitoring and kind of going, how am I reacting to this and how should I be reacting to this? How am I gonna do better next time, you know? And a lot of that is the ego stuff of the moment and and blocking and not blocking and all that stuff. So yeah, it's, it does take a while to figure that out. Yeah, and you know what? That That brings me to something that I actually deal with all the time, which is we have, I, I at least seem to have this sort of bias towards thinking that like whatever song I most recently wrote is probably the best song I'll ever write and I'll never be able to write another one that good again. And, and so when, you know, if you get caught in that trap and then someone tries to suggest that perhaps that song doesn't work so well in the context of this musical, or perhaps that song doesn't go with the album, maybe, you know, and then you can start feeling like, oh no, my babies, like don't, don't kill my babies, right? Um, but that's just not true. Like you've never written your best song. You're, as long as you keep writing, you're gonna be able to write other songs. I had to keep reminding myself of that, you know, because like once you write that first really good song and you're like, oh my gosh, I think I can actually maybe do this. You hold on to it and you're like, oh, I'll never do anything better than that. But you will, you will. And if you can just let that go and move forward, then, you know, whatever happens with those songs is kind of okay. Mm-hmm. you'll always write a better song because you are you and you wrote that last one and you have all those skills and, and you're still you keep, yeah you're going to keep learning them and you're still going to be you and be capable of writing another good song so wise that's so <laughs> wise um here's what i think we should do i think uh you should do one more song okay okay i will um well here i'll play you a song that's actually kind of halfway between musical theater and pop um, and then because, um, so it, it is from, it, it is now in our musical that's called The Ladder We Get, um, which if you feel like looking it up, it's, uh, it's actually based on a true story of Mark Hall, who, um, if you're from Canada, you might know he, um, back in 2003, um, something around there, he wanted to take his boyfriend to his high school prom and was not allowed by he went to catholic school and um they he ended up a lawyer approached him and they ended up taking the case to court and he won an injunction on the morning of his prom um and was allowed to take his boyfriend to the prom so uh we've written a musical that's based on that and it just uh finished a run that was the one that was at theater calgary in january of this year Luckily, all happened before COVID hit, and it was such a positive experience. It was wonderful. Um, But we had written most of that show, and we needed a song. We needed what we call a character's I Want song. And if you're interested in musical theater at all, then I highly suggest you Google this. Um, There's also a really great book out there um, for musical theater. It's by Jack Vertel, V-I-E-R-T-E-L. I forget what it's called. It's called like the Great American Musical, something like that. Um, but but in there, they'll definitely tell you about this. But there, you know, somewhere in the first like quarter of a show, usually the second song or the third song, there's what we call the I Want song, which tells us what the character wants. And uh, we could not figure out what, what it should be for this character. Um, and we had a different song and it wasn't working out so well and we were going into a workshop and we needed another song. And... Um, Akiva and I had actually started writing this song, which is called Infinite. We started writing it as just a a cute little pop song when we were at our friend Lindsay's cottage, like, years ago. Maybe, you know, two years before this actually happened. We had had written the chorus. Because we were lying on the dock and we were looking up at the stars and we were like, wow, you know, like, it is infinite out there. The stars are just like, the, the universe is so big, it makes us feel so small. And we had written this, the chorus, but we never really did anything with it. And then as we were writing this musical, it, it ended up, um, it ended up that we, you know, we wanted Mark to have, he's in real life, the actual person, Mark Hall is a scientist. And so we wanted him to, you know, be interested in science in our show. So we were like, oh my goodness, if we use this song that's about the stars and this infinite you know, universe, then he can be interested in astrology and he can use that metaphor to talk about how he wants to um, break out of this small town that is discriminating against him. So we ended up, Akiva wrote lyrics for the verse that kind of 
related more to that and we used this chorus we already had and so that's how this song infinite came about but because it started more like a pop song it does feel more like a pop song like it, it's to me it's it's kind of the perfect combination of the two things that i like to do so i'm gonna play this for you um I think that's all you need to know about it. Oh, good, Akiva's here, hi. Um, he says that, yeah, you guys can look in the comments. He said what that book is called, The Secret Life of the American Musical by Jack Vertel. And I know, I think it was Olive earlier who was asking about um, other songwriting resources. There are plenty. I would definitely say that book. Um, but if you're interested in more like pop songwriting, there is a book that Akiva actually gave me, which is called Writing Better Lyrics by Pat Patterson. I think he was John Mayer's songwriting teacher um so there's a good one and um, murray probably has more as well so if anyone has any other resources they want to tell people about put them in the comments let's share some information but there's definitely lots of stuff out there um I'll also i will say olive and everyone else i get a lot of my inf information and, and a lot of my um little like gems of, of sort of like tips and stuff from YouTube. Um, Akiva and I both watch a lot of YouTube, like interviews with people. There's a really great interview out there with um, Sia about how she comes up with her songs. Um, there's, you know, there's one out there, um, like Billboard does these ones called Behind the Lyrics, I think it's called. Um, and, and they'll have songwriters come and tell you like how they came up with their songs, how they came up with their lyrics. So go on YouTube and just look up songwriting or look up, you know, whatever genre you're interested in, like, just start going down that YouTube wormhole. Um, yeah, Pat Patterson. Yes, good. Okay, you already know. Wonderful. Um, okay, I'm going to sing you Infinite. And then, like, maybe after that, I'll hang out for a couple minutes. And if anyone has any more questions, I'll answer them because I don't want to not answer anybody's questions. But if you have to go, you have to go. I think this will be available later, too. So watch it later. All right. This song's usually sung by not me. <laughs> And so, you know, hopefully I don't mess it up. Check. Okay, there's my reverb. Every night I close my eyes and dream I'm drifting through the galaxy I am orbiting the nebula of endless possibilities
that's that. Thanks, Akiba, for writing those lyrics <laughs> and for putting up with me for 11 years. When you find here's good here's a good tip. When you find a co-writer that you really jive with, hold on to them and keep writing with them. <laughs> Don't let them go. <laughs> um, okay. Murray, is it cool if I answer a few more questions? Where'd you go, Murray? Where'd you go? Oh, was Luanne loving that song? Luanne, why don't you come here? Luanne, come. come. Too comfortable. Let me applaud for everyone who you can't hear applaud. This is this is 10,000 people applauding for you. Oh, wow. Wow, I didn't realize. <laughs> Luanne's going to come over and answer the last question with me. Here she is. Oh, love her. Um, OK. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I didn't miss any questions. Uh, favorite reverses, you know, it's from the song here, you know, for four. Okay. How can you start songwriting in English? I can compose. Ooh, okay. So I love this question um, from Arnab. Arnab? Um, I love this question, actually, because a couple of my favorite, so he's saying, he or she, or they, is saying that they're from India and English is not their mother tongue, um, but they want to start writing songs in English. And actually, a couple of my favorite writers and my favorite pop writers, especially, um, English is not their first language and they write in English. And I think it's incredible. Like there's this band I love called High as a Kite. It's all one word if you want to look them up. Um, I think they're from somewhere, I think, in Scandinavia. And you can tell that the, that English is is not their first language, uh, but it's it's so charming. Like it's so interesting, and the way that they choose to say things is in a completely different way than I would think of. So I actually think it's kind of a superpower if you if you speak other languages because you you can you know, create something and then try to translate it and then try to find ways that that could maybe rhyme. And if it doesn't make 100% sense, that is okay. You know how many pop songs there are out there where the chorus don't make any sense? Like, that is fine. So just start writing. I would say just start writing. And then if you if you are concerned that, you know, you're, uh, that you, that your English, you know, you're not quite sure how to say something or whatever, then find a co-writer. Find a co-writer who English is their first language, and then you can share and work on things together. But, yeah, just don't be afraid to dive right in. I think that's that's the point. That's a, that's a great answer. Let's do one more question. And I think it's this one. Do you have a method process for coming up with your melodies? And I will say before you answer this, mm -hmm. you really have a knack for soaring melodies, like for like in that last song for sure. Just these soaring, huge melodies that are like that are so emotional and so catchy and all that stuff. So, where do they come from? Where do they come from? Um, I mean, I love melody and harmony. That's really like I just listen to tons of music and I sing along with tons of music. Like that's how I got good at harmony was singing along with songs I liked. Um, but in terms of coming up with melodies, I just try to. Look, you don't have to come up with the most amazing melody on your first try, right? So just put something down, figure something out. You know, if you have a line you want to sing, right? Like, so like, let's work through this. One second. Luann, you go. Okay. So Akiva brought, you know, would have brought me the lyric. Um, Every night I close my eyes and dream I'm drifting through the galaxy, right? And so I would sit down and I don't know, just find something I like. And... Uh, I, maybe I started with every night I close my eyes and dream I'm drifting through the galaxy so that's a great place to start right um, and then I would say okay maybe I need something to make it a little more interesting maybe I should not stick on the same note that often unless that's your point because there are some great songs that stick on one note for the whole time so there's no rules here but you know maybe I go okay there's nothing like, I, I need a little more variety here. Then I try to pick out what words are really important in that phrase, because kind of just inherently, if a word, if a note is higher, that's going to kind of highlight that word. Um, that's just kind of like, at least that's how my brain works, right? So if I'm going to put a, a high note in there, I want that to be on an important word and vice versa. If there's an important word, I want to put it on possibly a higher note. So, you know, um, every night, I don't know, I wanted that to be, Every night, I want I want people to understand. This is the first line of the song. I need them to understand that this is taking place at night when there's stars out, right? So I thought that was an important word. So every night, every. 
every night I close my eyes and dream. You know, so that's part of my method. I could talk for, I could do a whole nother masterclass on my method for melodies, but I would say start somewhere. Like, don't be afraid to just put something down. Uh-oh. I knew that was sleep for a second, and then it's going to go back to normal. I think you're good. Okay. Anyway. Um, wait, so is it crinkly on your end at all? It's a bit crinkly, but it's okay. Okay, well, okay. Goodbye, crinkles. Um, but yeah, put something down. Putting something down is better than putting nothing down because you're too afraid. <laughs> and then you can go from there and edit it and go, okay, I lower. Also, sometimes we'll come up with something and be like, wait a second, that sounds just like something else that I know. Oh, I think I accidentally ripped off, <laughs> you know, Celine Dion. And then I'll change it. And and I'll sometimes, if it's a few notes, that's fine. But if it's like, I think what's, I don't know, the rule is something like seven notes in a row or something that's exactly the same. You should maybe look at that. So then I'll just change a couple of the notes. Some of my melodies have actually become what they are because I was trying to not sound like somebody else. So mm -hmm. those are my yeah, and uh, those are great tips. And I think, um, you know, as you say that higher notes grab the attention more, I think that's a really important point. And, and I can tell with your writing that you, you, you make these vertical leaps in melody that, uh, that are super effective. And I think for people listening who are interested in melody, um, that's something to keep in mind. Like you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you write your initial melody and as you did just there, like maybe it's it's a low melody, you can consciously raise some of those melodic notes um, for effect, realizing that those higher notes are gonna grab more attention, right? Um, that your chorus melody should be higher than your verse melody, for example. And so you can actually like, don't think of melody as something you just sort of stumble on and you can't change. You can tweak it and you can keep changing it until you until you find something that really works, so. Yeah, Absolutely. that's very great. Yeah, um, I'll, just, I'll wrap it up here, but I'll just say, I see a few people in the comments saying that they'd be more interested in hearing more about Melody. I have no, nothing planned at this point, but if you are actually interested, come follow me on social media. Um, I have a Facebook page if you look up Colleen Dauncey. It's probably also linked on this thing. I'll put it in the comments, um, but also follow me on Instagram at Colleen Dauncey. Because if enough people ask me, I'll usually do something. So the other thing is, like, we'll, we'll definitely have you back for, if not a master class, then we'll pull you into our intermediate class or something like that to, to expand. To yeah, for sure. Um, so it's not the last we've heard of you or you've heard of us. I don't know which way that goes. But um, anyway, I, we should I probably wrap it up because people need to go to sleep and get ready for a long day of Zooming tomorrow. Oh. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you. That was amazing. And I learned a lot. I think that, that was a great masterclass. So thank you. And this is on behalf of, and if we can have people in the chat, please put some thank yous up there for Colleen so she can see them herself. I'll just take my word for it. Um, that was amazing. Guys, those were great uh, questions. Like your students and the other people who are on here are so smart. I love these questions. Pretty smart, yeah. Um, so thank you and uh, please, there's the pay what you can along the bottom. Please do that, everyone out there, uh, if you haven't yet. Um, in two weeks, we have another master class and it's Erin McKeown. It looks like McEwen, but it's McKeown. She is an American songwriter. She was signed to Ani DeFranco's label, um, uh, had a very pretty extensive pop career, pop rock career and then wrote a musical that went off Broadway. So again, someone who works in these two worlds, um, very experienced, very great songwriter. So come back in two weeks for that. Um, check out our website, torontosongwritingschool.com. Uh, jump in a class. Um, we have getaways that happen. There's um, a studio here for you to work in as well. Um, and there's the RSVP for the next master class, which is in two weeks. It's up on the website. Uh, so finally, thank you, Colleen. It was great to see you. You too. I'm just sticking my information in the little comment thing, so you'll see it in a second. Cool. I'm not like, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to explore. Yeah, yeah. What's happening on Instagram is what Colleen is saying. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. And, and and a shout out to Akiva, who's watching somewhere. Um, Colleen's a, a co-writer for your great yeah. words as part of this song as well. 
And uh, thanks to everyone for, for tuning in. And hopefully we see you again uh, in two weeks. And that's pretty much it. So have a great night, everyone. And we will, me. This yeah. was so much fun. It was great. I love it. Yeah. It's nice to feel like I'm hanging out with you, Murray. Yeah, it was great. Okay. okay. We'll see you, everyone.